It's fair to say that everybody's heard about or knows about Make-A-Wish Foundation. Frank Shankwitz, the founder of Make-A-Wish Foundation back in 1980, is here now to tell us how it all started with one small wish. Hi, my name is Frank Shankwitz, probably better known as the creator and co-founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation and was the first president and CEO. And we're here at the historic Palace Restaurant and Saloon in Prescott, Arizona right now. Make-A-Wish, how did it happen? It all started because of a little boy who loved the television show called Chips back in the mid-70s. And this show was about the adventures of two California Highway Patrol motorcycle officers, Ponch and John. Very popular with the age group seven on up. And I was a motorcycle officer with the Arizona Highway Patrol during this period. And this little boy, Chris, unfortunately had terminal leukemia. And he told his mother, when I grow up, I want to be a Highway Patrol motorcycle officer, just like Ponch and John. Well, the family contacted the Highway Patrol through a customs agent named Tommy Austin, who had friends with the Highway Patrol, and said, is there any way that this little boy could meet one of the Highway Patrol motorcycle officers just hang out for the day? Now, Chris, again, terminal leukemia, only a couple weeks to live. But our department, the Arizona Highway Patrol, got very involved. And with permission of his doctor and his mother, Chris was picked up at our state police is a hospital on our state police helicopter and flown to our headquarters building in Phoenix. And they asked me to stand by with my motorcycle when the helicopter approached. Now, I've never met this little boy. Helicopters approaching, all I can see is this face plastered against the glass, a big smile. He's looking down because our equipment was identical to California Highway Patrol. In fact, we, we trained initially up in Sacramento with them. Our uniforms are almost identical. So as far as he was concerned, he's looking at one of the guys from the show Chips. Helicopter lands. I expected our paramedics to help him out. Instead, door opens up, this little red pair of sneakers jumps out, runs with the motorcycle. Hi, I'm Chris, can I get on? He is just laughing and giggling and have the time of his life. Now this little boy had just come off the hospital. He's just come off IVs. I'm looking at his mother and she's crying. Why is she crying? It dawned on me, she has her seven-year-old back. He's not laying in a hospital. But Chris went on that day to become the first and only Highway Patrol officer in the history of the Highway Patrol at that time, complete with a custom-made uniform we had made for him, the smoky hat, the own badge that is assigned to him today, but most important to him, his motorcycle wings, making him a full police motorcycle officer. Chris got to go home that night, and for the next two days, everything was fine with him. The doctors couldn't understand. His vitals were so good. But unfortunately, a few days later, he passed away. And I always like to think maybe those wings helped carry him to heaven. Now, our commanders learned that Chris was going to be buried in a little town called Kewanee, Illinois, south of Chicago, and approached me and my partner and said, we have lost a fellow officer. We would like you and your partner to go back and give Chris a full police funeral which we did. Now this is in 1980, and there is no such thing as cell phones, internet, but the media, the press was picking this up. And in fact, when we landed in Chicago, we were met by the press describing this mission that we were on. But the press also notified Illinois State Police, the county police, the city police, in this little town of Kewanee. And unbeknownst to us, as we came in there, all of these agencies met us to help bury this little boy, to give this boy a full police funeral. And Chris was buried in uniform. In fact, his grave marker reads, Chris Gracious, Arizona Trooper. But flying home, I just started thinking, here's a boy who had a wish, and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? And that's when the idea of the Make-A-Wish Foundation was born, maybe 35,000 feet over Kansas or somewhere. And, and it was just, we're going to make this happen. We're going to have children make a wish, and we're going to make that happen. How do you start a foundation? I had no idea. I'm a police officer. I don't know if anybody remembers library cards, go to the library, again, this is before internet, research, how do you do this? The hardest part was to finding, in Arizona, we have to have five people per the Corporation Commission to start a foundation. And everybody I approached that was involved with Chris, this is my idea, let's do this, it'll never work. I, I, we, we don't want to get involved with that. Well, in my youth, being living in Seligman, Arizona, up on old Route 66, I had a mentor that always taught me, turn those negatives into positives. 
People say you can't do it, find out why you can't do it and make it happen. And I remembered that and that's what I did, just persistence, stickability, I love that word, don't give up on your idea, your mission. And eventually within six months I did find those other five people and in uh, November of 1980 the Make-A-Wish Foundation became official. We granted our first official wish in March of 1981. <clears throat> and when we started the foundation, it was for children with life-threatening illnesses. And leukemia was a death sentence in those days. These children did not survive. About 20 years ago, the mission was changed to children with life-threatening illnesses uh, because we're getting unofficially, about 70% of children are surviving these medical conditions. I always like to say through the grace of God and modern medicine, more and more children are surviving. But because of one little boy who wanted to be a highway patrol motorcycle officer and started his foundation, now 40 years later, Make-A-Wish Foundation is in 45 countries on five continents, 62 chapters in the United States, and we have just gone over half a million wishes granted worldwide because of one little boy who wanted to be a highway patrol motorcycle officer. People ask me all the time, what's maybe your favorite wish? Well, out of half a million wishes, that's so hard. And, and there's been so many, uh, what, whatever the child imagination is, I, I want to go uh, a basketball, simple as that. I want a pair of tennis shoes. I want to go out to dinner with my family. I've never been to a restaurant. I want to meet the Pope. I want to be the President of the United States. If all that happened. But there's one boy, our first official wish uh, in 1981, uh, again a seven-year-old boy nicknamed Bopsy, a um, little Hispanic boy, again terminal leukemia. And his wish was to go to Disneyland. Now we're in Arizona, we had not thought about travel wishes outside of the state. Uh, the wishes are, and they only get one wish, um, to have, to be, to meet, to go. And he said, I want to go to Disneyland. I thought, well, okay, we'll, we'll see if we can do that. And we called Disney and identified ourselves as a Make-A-Wish Foundation. We would like, if we could, free admission into the park, if we could get in front of the line. He's very ill as a, a, in a wheelchair. And the Secretary for Decker of Public Relations would not speak to us. And, and we learned later that Disney gets all of these calls all of the time. And they didn't know who the Make-A-Wish Foundation was. So I finally got the name that I needed to call and I called myself and instead of saying I'm the President and CEO of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, I said this is Officer Frank Shank with Arizona Highway Patrol. And you could almost see the Secretary maybe sitting up a little straight and she said, how can I help you? I said, I need to talk, talk to the Director of Public Relations. What is it about? I said, I have a warrant for one of your people. Well, guess who I got to talk to? <laughs> And the minute I got the gentleman on the phone, I said, I just lied to you. Here's my name, here's my badge number, here's my supervisor's name, and here's his phone number. All you have to do is call him and I will be terminated immediately. But the gentleman listened to my story and because of that, Disney, now one of the biggest sponsors in the world uh, for Make-A-Wish, I mean just hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars and wishes all over. And sometimes you gotta lie, but <laughs> qualify that lie right away. But because of Disney, that opened up the door for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. They splashed it all over the media and all of a sudden we are nationwide. We're getting calls now in 1981, how do we start chapters throughout the United States? And by 1983, we started chapters throughout the United States and world just because of Disney. I was uh, born in Chicago, war baby, World War II baby, and at uh, age two, my mother divorced my father and left. We never had any idea where. Uh, at age five, I'm on a uh, kindergarten playground. A lady grabs me. She says, I'm your mother. I had no idea who she was. Uh, literally kidnapped me. And she said, we're going to Arizona. I had no idea where Arizona was. We didn't have geography in uh, kindergarten at that point. But ended up in Michigan, of all places. And for the next five years, was just survival. Um, we lived in a tent in the summer times, very poor. Food was always an issue. Uh, in the winter time in Michigan, obviously very cold winters, old flop houses, we lived in cars in the summertime back in a tent. Again, survival, food, it was just an issue. But the biggest thing was I started learning how to take care of myself. At age 10, my father found us in Michigan and went to get the local authorities to arrest her. During that time, she threw everything we had in a station wagon and she said, we're going to Arizona. And it took six weeks to drive from Michigan to Arizona. 
<clears throat> because she didn't have enough money. She'd drive a day, get a job at a restaurant for enough tip money, get to the next town, sleeping in the car all the way. And again, just a, a rough existence for any child. But it's not unusual, really, at that time period. Uh, at 10 years old, ended up in a little town called Sligman, Arizona, up on old Route 66. And this was the first permanent type town we had ever lived in, because we never really lived in a town. She kept us away so my father couldn't find us. But became, I started washing dishes full time at 10 years old, full time job. But I developed a mentor, a gentleman named Juan Delgadillo, who I feature in the Wishman movie that's out. In fact, it's on Netflix right now. Became my father figure. Uh, I had never had anybody to teach me things like carpentry, any type of skills whatsoever. And my mentor. But the biggest thing he taught me during that time was, Frank, when you can, give back. And I, what do you mean, Juan, give back? We don't have a thing. The poor people are helping us. And he said, you don't have to have money to give back. And this is a message that I give today, even in this movie, to do how everyone can be a hero. You can give back your time. And he gave an example. Look at the widow Sanchez. Look at her front yard. It's full of weeds. Her porch needs painting. And she's always bringing your mom, you and your mom, beans and tortillas when she can to help you out. You can give back by cleaning up that yard, by painting that porch. You don't have to have money to give back. And that lesson has stuck with me my whole life. Uh, went to high school here in Prescott, um, graduated in high school, went into the Air Force, uh, Vietnam era, and following my enlistment in the Air Force, went to work in Motorola in Phoenix for seven years. But it was during that time that I, I got, I'm a country boy, I didn't like the big city, and several of my friends had joined the Arizona Highway Patrol and just kept saying, Frank, why don't you join the patrol? With your engineering background, with your background in the service, you'd be a perfect fit. I say, guys, I make in one week what you make in a month, and I'm, I'm just not going to give up that salary. But I started thinking about it and just on a whim put an application, and that was in 1972, was accepted. I said, okay, let's try this. I'll go to the academy. It was probably a great career choice because 42 years later, I finally retired as a homicide detective <laughs> with the Arizona Department of Public Safety. Now, in, in 2011, uh, I was doing this presentation for the Make-A-Wish Foundation in San Diego. A gentleman uh, was there and said, how much do you charge for your speaking? I said, well, I don't charge for Make-A-Wish. This is my foundation. He said, no, for private events. I said, well, I never thought about it. He said, I need to get you on a speaking tour. I thought, well, it's interesting. I'm thinking about retiring. I did get on the speaking tour, a whole new career path for me. Uh, in fact, 2016, I'm going to boast a little bit, I was a Forbes number one keynote speaker in the nation. And I was also approached during that time about a gentleman named Greg Reed said, I want to do a movie about you. And I thought he meant a documentary. He said, no, a full length motion picture. I said, no, you don't. And he said, yes, I do. And I said, well, I, I'd be interested in that, but I, I don't know what we do. And he said, we want to relate how everyone can be a hero, how you can give back. And I said, well, if I have script approval, we're going to do that. Now, this is in uh, 2013. It took us two and a half years to write the screenplay. And we actually started filming in Prescott because I wanted to give back to this community. Hollywood brings a lot of money into a community. And I wanted to give back here. And I lobbied very hard for that movie to be filmed here. And the movie, again, is a Wish Man, available on Netflix right now. But. Um, so we did film here, and it's about my adventures in, in life. Uh, it's a period piece, 1950 to 1980, from age 10 to when I created the Make-A-Wish Foundation. All the people that helped me out, my coaches, my teachers, e everyone uh, on the Highway Patrol. And it, it was such a great feeling that when this movie was released in 20, uh, last year, we became a small budget independent movie. We became qualified for Academy Award nomination for Best Picture. I mean, what, what, a, what a testimony to the cast, crew, the screenwriter, everybody else that was involved in this. And right now what I'm doing is promoting this movie, uh, but I'm also sitting on seven nonprofit boards around the nation. Uh, again, giving back when I can. Uh, our nonprofits are located in New Jersey, New York, Las Vegas, Seattle, Phoenix, um, I'm missing somewhere, uh, LA. But again, giving back when you can. I remember what Juan told me, you don't have to have money to give back, you give back your time. Just help somebody out, be kind, be a hero. 
people ask how they can contact me, the best way is on my website, Wishman1. That's the number one, wishman1.com. Uh, they're also asking you know, how to get available, how to purchase the book or the uh, DVD, the movie DVD. And that's available on Amazon, uh, like I say, Sean and Netflix, but on my website, if you want an autographed copy of either one, just go to the website, wishman1.com. I'm also on Facebook, follow me there, I'll friend you, we'll just have a good time, see what's going on. And Frank, here we are, yeah. I must say, we want to thank Frank for coming and sharing his story and the story of Make-A-Wish, which is a fantastic ongoing story, continuing well, on. Continuing on, but I want to thank you for making the drive clear up here to Prescott, but especially in a historic palace there to meet us here. I mean, this yeah. is so much fun here. Prescott is really an outstanding place to be, and, and uh, we'll be showing you a lot of Prescott in this show. That's fantastic. Yes. That's great. Yes. Okay. Well, say hello to Kitty. I will say hello and, to Kitty. And uh, we're going to close now, but nice, nice having uh, you here. So long. Thanks, folks.